What a beautiful worship song. So, let's take a moment. Let's pray. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you so much for your many, 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 many blessings. And I, we come in your presence, God, for your word. We just pray, God, that you will open our hearts and understanding. Our obedience so that God we might receive what you have to say use it for your glory in Jesus name we pray amen, amen. I um might have mentioned that here before I'm not sure but I've been dealing with this personal situation from a spiritual standpoint where I've been feeling as though I am at this bottleneck like the Lord is warning someone told me that it's not loud enough We good? Can you hear me? Yeah. All right, awesome. Make a difference. Yeah, as I was saying, been feeling that I'm at this bottleneck. Like the Lord is trying to clarify, do something, and I think all of us believers, we have these moments. Moments where you realize where you are. But also you realize what God is trying to do in your life. He's trying to transition you towards something that is closer to what he's intending to do. But as much as these realizations are personal, individual, they are also corporate to the body of Christ. Because the body of Christ as an entity has been called for a specific purpose. I, uh, one of my sons is very wild. His name is Malik. <laughs> he does things sometimes and you like, what are you doing? So we were moving stuff, and then my wife notices there's this red mark, a smiley face mark on the wall. She asks, well, what is that? Apparently, the night before, I don't know if he stubbed his toe or something, and he, he was bleeding. So he grabbed the blood and he decided he's gonna make a smiley face. <laughs> and my reaction, I was telling Mosa, I'm gonna give that boy a whooping, you know? <laughs> and as parents, there are certain things that are clear to us, we can understand them. When our children, don't do what they're supposed to do. Our desire is to get them to where they need to get to. we looking to discipline them, not for the purpose of just punishment for the sake of punishment, but we want to get them right. We want to get them to act in a way that is going to be beneficial and positive for their lives. And that's what I mean as a body, corporately, the intention of Jesus Christ for the body, for the church, it must be carried out. It will carry out. It's just that sometime it will indeed necessitate that God does some 
disciplining in the body. He has to apply pressure in some areas, relieve pressure in others. He has to do whatever he has to do to get the body moving in the direction that he wants the body to move. Now, the title of the sermon this morning is Dare to Speak. And we'll be looking at Romans 10, verse 14 to 17. But before we even get there, turn with me, if you will, to the book of Acts, chapter 3. Acts, chapter 3. Because in the book of Acts, chapter 3, we have this incident that we see that happens with Peter and John. So we told that Peter and John, they were going to the temple at the time of prayer at 3 p.m. And we also told around the same time, there was a man who was lame from birth. And what they used to do is just carry that man and set him down at one of the gates of the temple. And this particular gate was called the beautiful gate. And they would put him there and he would daily ask for alms, you know, for people to give him a donation because he was lame from birth. So he couldn't do nothing for himself. And it just so happened that that day, as Peter and John was going in, he noticed them and he asked them for money. And Peter turned towards him and he said to the men, look at us. If you're asking for money, you don't have any and someone tell you to look at them, you want to look at them because the men was hoping that they were going to give him some money. And then Peter said to him in verse 6, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. And glory to God, the man, tendons, everything that was not working came together and the man walked. Hallelujah. And they went into the temple and the man was just following after them. He was just excited with good reason. And as he was following after them, other people who knew that man, they were, is, isn't that the lame man as always at the temple gate? He's walking. So that created a commotion. People started gathering, asking questions, coming up to Peter and John. And Peter and John, they used that opportunity to start preaching the gospel message. They were telling the people, why are you looking at us like we're something special? It's not us. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. So that created even more noise. So that got to the attention of the rulers and elders of the people. And I'm going to read for you from chapter 4, verse 1 to 17. If 
you turn there as well. Go to the trusty Bible. Acts 4, 1 to 17. So the rulers, the captain of the guards, the authorities in the temple, they heard about the commotion. And we read these words. Now, as they spoke to the people, the priest, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees, they came upon them. Being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them. And they put them into custody. They got arrested. Until the next day, for it was already evening. However, many of those who heard the word believed. And the number of the men came to be about 5,000. And it came to pass on the next day that the rulers, elders, and scribes, as well as Annas, the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and as many as were of the family of the high priest, they gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they brought John and Peter again. They asked them, by what power or by what name you have done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders of Israel, If we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man. Because why did they arrest them? They arrested them. Because they actually healed somebody that was lame from birth. Think about that for a moment. If we judge for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means he has been made well? Let it be known to you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole. Amen. So they continued questioning them. And by the time we get to verse 17, they had made a decision. They said, look, we can't hide this because that man, everybody knows him, the lame man. We cannot pretend that this miracle didn't happen because the people saw it. What are we to do? So in verse 17, it says, but to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn them, warn Peter and John, to speak no longer to anyone in this name. Then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. Isn't it interesting that a lot of times people continually talk about the lack of evidence? 
If God wanted me to follow him, why doesn't he just show up? Then I would believe. No, you wouldn't. Perfect example. Why is it that the leaders and the rulers didn't take time to say, oh my goodness, what an extraordinary thing that just happened. Let's try to figure this thing out. Maybe we missed something. How could this be? Explain us about this Jesus. Because they were given something extraordinary. Sometimes when we read certain things in scripture, we let it pass us. Think of it, brothers and sisters. This was a man that has been like this from birth. Lame all of his life. And all of a sudden, there's a miracle. Instead of taking that miracle and build on it the foundations of faith, they try to suppress, to hide, to do everything that they can to not let it out. The same thing is still going on today in different ways. But it's still the same thing. They were commanded not to speak. I want to focus our attention. Three verses. Verse 12. As they started answering. We're still in chapter 4 of Acts. As they started answering the leaders. They said in verse 12. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. There's no other way. Jesus is the only way. Because it's in verse 18 that they called them in again and they commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of of Jesus. It is what Peter and John replied in verse 19 and 20. It was so significant. So they told them not to teach, not to speak. And they said to the leaders, after they told them that, gave them that command, they said, which is right in God's eyes? To listen to you or to him? You be the judges. You tell us what you think we should do. We're supposed to listen to you or listen to God. And they said, as for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. We cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard at Acts 4, 19 to 20. Now, in the opening verses of the book of Acts, Acts chapter 1, and theologians believe it's the same person that wrote Acts, wrote Luke, because it's addressed to the same person, Theophilus, and in Acts 1, he lays out to Theophilus by reviewing, he's saying, remember the thing that I told you about in the previous book that I wrote. And he's touching on the point saying that, remember how I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until he was taken up to heaven. And he reminded Theophilus that after Jesus' suffering, that Jesus presented himself to them, and he gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days. And he spoke about the kingdom of God. 
Now, many people think that Jesus Christ just came back to life on the third day, hung out for a little bit, a couple of days, and he's like, peace out, I got to go. Nah. He hung around for a good little while, putting certain things in order, preparing them for what was to come, telling them, hey, wait in Jerusalem until you receive the Holy Spirit. He was giving evidence. You know me, I was with you. All of you know I was killed. I was on that cross, but here I am. I'm sure we know about Thomas, where Thomas was say, I won't believe until I touch and see. But I'm sure Thomas was, just the, was not the only one just allowed to touch and see. For 40 days, he spoke about the kingdom of God. For 40 days, the dead person that was horribly killed on the cross tortured, beaten, that dead man was back again alive, spending time with his disciples. How amazing is that? And they tell us there's no proof. There's no evidence. And in verse 6 and 7, Still in Acts 1, we read these words. They gathered around him, and they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now, when... Peter and John were told, you are not allowed to speak any longer in that name. It's forbidden. It's not going to happen. Their response was, hey, like we said earlier, should I listen to you or should I listen to God? And they signified it by saying, we cannot help speaking about what we have Seen and heard. Now, why is that significant? It is significant because those men, they were eyewitnesses to the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Someone didn't call them and told them about it. They were there. They saw. They spoke to Jesus. They heard from Jesus. So that's why they're saying, we can't help it. Have you ever had someone that asked you to say something that you know that was a lie, but they really just were expecting you to actually lie, lie? Like, I know it's a lie. You know that I know it's a lie. We both know that it's a lie, but you want me to just lie about it to you right now? These men wouldn't have that. They were called by Jesus Christ to be his witnesses. So they were eyewitnesses who were commended to be witnesses to what they'd seen and heard. Now, I was looking a word search, you know, of the word witnesses, trying to look at the biblical usages and term. And there are three ways in which the word is used biblically. This word, witness. First, it's used in a legal sense. 
this is, this is a sin that we all know about because when someone goes before a judge, they're accused of a crime, you produce what? Witnesses that can either corroborate what is the person being accused of or maybe keep them from being accused falsely. That witness is there for that reason. So in that legal sense, we understand it. Interestingly enough, you remember when Jesus Christ was brought before the leaders to be judged, we read that they had set up what? False witnesses that were lying about Jesus, saying he did things and said things he did not say so they can have reason to condemn him. Think about Jesus. Jesus was so righteous. His work was so straight. Even the four witnesses could not really accuse him properly. What are you going to accuse Jesus of? He's the truth. But we understand that significance in the legal sense, what it means to be a witness. The second sense is a historical one. People who are present during an event that happened in the past, they wrote about what they witnessed because we didn't have iPhone and all these devices. They had to write down the account. And then they had other people that could back up what they were saying. So you have, in the historical sense, witnesses to history. And Peter and John qualify because there were some of these people that were witnesses of the historical events of the cross. And we told in scripture that there were a whole bunch of others. All the ones that Jesus appeared to, all of them were witnesses of historical events. And then you have it used in an ethical sense. When these followers of Jesus Christ were confronted about the testimony that they were saying about Jesus Christ, what were they willing to do? They would rather die than change their testimony. So in an ethical sense, they were so convinced of the facts of the truth that they had witnessed that they would lay their lives down for it because they knew that it was the truth. The life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is supported in all three sins. In the legal sense, in the historical sense, and the ethical sense. My sermon, actually, to you this morning, believe it or not, that was still an introduction. (laughs) But it's good. Because in spite of this rather lengthy introduction, it's a pretty straightforward and short affair. It is. Turn with me, if you will, to Romans chapter 10, verse 14 to 17. Romans 10, 14 to 17. We covered part of this, the last sermon that I preached here. But by way of reminders, the book of Romans, Paul wrote it to address many, many points. But three of the points that Paul drove home, they were that, first of all, that 
In Romans 1, he talks about how everyone has been given a, a measure of revelation. That's why in Romans 1, he talks about people are without excuse. Because that which is known about God is evident within them. And he also spoke about how whether you are a Jew or a Gentile, everyone is under the same condemnation. Because everyone has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And then he also touched upon the fact that whether you are a Jew or a Gentile, you could only be saved by the same means. There was not one mean of salvation for one group and a different mean for another group. Both had to be saved in the same way. And that way was not by the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So in Romans 10, 14 to 17, we see something laid out for us where we read these words. How then are they to call on him in whom they have not believed? How are they to believe in him who they, they have not heard? And how are they to hear without a preacher? But how are they to preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. However, they did not all heed the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. Now, the section of passage right before this one, it was talking about a promise that was laid out. Because in verse 11 to 13 prior to this section, Paul was saying that the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Whoever believes in Jesus Christ will not be put to shame. Because there's no distinction between Jews and Greeks. Because the same Lord is Lord of all. And he has riches of grace for all who call on him. And then verse 13 said, Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, since everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, then it follows that if I want someone to be saved, I should want them to know about the Lord so then they would call on the name of the Lord. So that is why the question that is asked right after that is, well, how then are they to call on him if they've not believed in him? How can I call on the Lord if I don't know that I need to call on the Lord? So the answer given is, well, they must believe. Well, how are they supposed to believe in Jesus if they have not heard of him? Well, someone must preach to them. And who is supposed to preach to them? We're told that those who are sent. Well, the next question then, who are sent? Well, every single one of us who are called to be witnesses of Jesus Christ. The same thing that John and Peter did, they were witnesses, they were sent. And the people that they witnessed to now, they become witnesses that were witnessed to, so they are sent. You are sent, I am sent. Someone might be said, well, I'm not a preacher. That's not my gift. I don't know how to preach. I'm terrified of speaking in front of people. 
that's a good point. Because not everyone has the same gifts. Everyone is given different gifts. But does that mean only those that been given the gift of speaking, preaching, are supposed to preach? No. You all are called to be witnesses to the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, the next question asked in the same passage is, will all listen to the good news? No. Matter of fact, many will not listen. So should I still preach? Yes. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So where does that leave us? Pay attention to the current reality. It's not very different from the old reality, but it is our reality. We as believers in this century, we must Meet that reality. Because the bottleneck that I'm talking to you about at the beginning is this bottleneck of realization that, yes, I am excited about what Jesus Christ has done for me. Yes, I am certain that he has saved me from my sins. Because I know my sins. And I know what the Lord has saved me from. I don't need to compare my sin to someone else's sin. I know my sins. So I know the Lord has saved me. What is the current reality, though? There are four things that people are doing when it comes to the word of God. Presently, the first one we actually talked about a little bit in a sermon I did the last time is in Romans 1 where it talks about how people suppress the truth of God. Even though they know what they should, should know about God, they suppress it. So we live in a reality where you have one group of people that they are suppressing the truth of God. Secondly, there's this unwillingness of believers to continue the great commission and to be ambassadors for Christ. They are unwilling. They refuse to do the work of being ambassadors of Jesus Christ. And number three, there's oppression of the believers. Oppression of the believers. And number four, isolation. And I borrowed these four points from a user called Nathan Hall. He was answering a question, and he mentioned these four points. And I believe they mesh perfectly with what we are facing. Listen. In America... We have freedom of speech for now. Not even trying to be funny for now. Because things are changing real fast. So that means we still have an open door of opportunity to speak. Now, people are already suppressing the truth. The same things that the leaders were trying to get Peter and John to do, it's already in effect. The truth is being suppressed. If you speak a truth about the Lord God that is not accepted, you will get suppressed. Another way people are suppressing the truth is by themselves. They know and understand the things of God, but they are choosing to reject it. That's suppression. The unwillingness that we're talking about of believers 
to continue the Great Commission. And what is the Great Commission? You know it. Go and preach the gospel to all people. That is a command given to all of us. Now, the unwillingness has different, I'll call them excuses, attached to them because they are ultimately excuses. I know because I've made many of them before. Someone might say, well, I'm willing, but I really don't know how to share the gospel. That's a good point. May I offer you one way you can if you're one of those people that you don't know that you know how to share the gospel? Remember what John and Peter said. They, could, they can help it. They've seen it. They've heard it. So they have to give witness. You and I, we have come to believe, a lot of us, based on the witness of these people who saw and heard what happened. All of you, if Jesus Christ is your Savior, you have a testimony of your own. You're able to tell someone, this is what the Lord Jesus has done for me. If you don't know how to say anything else, you know how to say that, correct? You can give testimony to your own life, how God has impacted you. Start with that. And then point them to the records that tell them about the life of Jesus Christ. Have them read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Tell them, hey, if you were in danger of dying, would you be willing to spend one hour to prevent yourself from dying? I would. You would. Tell them, hey, this is what Jesus has done for me. Honestly, I don't know how to explain everything, but this is the account of his life. Would you take an hour, break it up over a period of days, Read through the Gospel of John. Read through the Gospel of Matthew. We all can do that. Do you agree? Here's how you're going to know if you're really preaching the Gospel. Here's how you're going to know if you've gotten through that bottleneck and you've gotten to that point where you know what? I don't care anymore. I'm just going to do what God wants me to do. Because a lot of us, we are operating in fear. We are afraid of all type of things. We are afraid of being embarrassed. We are afraid of embarrassing other people. We are afraid of not knowing what to say. We are afraid of maybe I'm saying the wrong thing. Some of us are afraid in this climate of being canceled. We're afraid if we said something, they're going to blast us and they call us names. We are afraid. Don't be afraid. Dare to speak. You're going to know if you're preaching the gospel because you remember what they asked John and Peter to do? They're going to start asking you to do the same thing. They're going to start asking questions about you. Huh, what are we going to do with them? they starting to cause problems. We need to shut them up. You're going to start feeling the pressure and tension of the world. The world will start to hate you. Because you... Bring the light of Christ to the reality of the world. A 
oppression of the believers. This part, let me read this to you. And this is from Open Doors USA. I'm just going to read the top three. Places in the world where your brothers and mine, your sisters and mine, are facing oppression. At the top of the least list, we have North Korea. They've been number one for 19 consecutive years. For three generations, everything in this isolated country has focused on idolizing the ruling Kim family. Christians are seen as hostile elements in society that must be eradicated. At all costs, they must keep their faith completely secret. If a Christian has the Bible or part of one, it will be carefully hidden and only read when the believer is sure they are alone. Most Christians do not even tell their own children about their faith until they are older teenagers for fear that they may let something slip. As you can imagine, gathering for worship in a church is non-existent. Daring to meet other Christians for worship is a risk Because it must be done with the utmost secret. That's North Korea. When someone is discovered to be a Christian in North Korea, they will be arrested and imprisoned in one of North Korea's terrible labor camps or even killed on the spot. Their families to the fourth generation share their fate as well. You found to be a Christian, they'll get you, your kids, your uncle, your cousin, everyone related to you. This is not 500 years ago. This is happening in 2021. Afghanistan. Isn't that great? Those who are discovered to be a Christian in Afghanistan, they may be sent to a mental hospital because their families believe no sane person would leave Islam. They may be beaten or even killed by family members or members of Islamic extremist groups like the Taliban, which continues to increase in strength. Violence against Christians remains very high, but the measures taken against converts depends on the family. One Christian in Afghanistan says, how we survive daily, only God knows. He knows because he has been kind to dwell with us, but we are tired of all the death around us. Let's do one more. In Pakistan, all Christians suffer from institutionalized discrimination, illustrated by the fact that occupations seen as low, dirty, and derogatory are reserved for religious minorities like Christians by the authorities. Many Christians are poor and some are victims of bonded labor. They are Christians belonging to the middle class as well, but this economic status doesn't save Christians from being marginalized or persecuted in an Islamic culture. Believers are always at risk because of the country's notorious blasphemy laws. And it goes on and on and on 
and on. Brothers and sisters, I would like for us to find some ways, somehow, as a body, I'm speaking corporately, but I'm also speaking here to our church, Lakeland Bible Church. Let's start with us, right? I have to start with me. You have to start with you. We have to start with Lakeland Bible Church, and then we start spreading out. We need to stop making excuses. I do. You do. You know at least one person who's not saved, and you've not witnessed to them for whatever reason. I have had many, many occasions when I've sat down and I'm thinking through and I'm like, why didn't I just share the gospel with this person? To my shame, there's been instances where someone said something or asked a question that would have been a golden opportunity. I didn't capitalize on it. I think I feel tired. Tired of the state that I am, that maybe we are as a body. Because the world that we live in, <laughs> everyone is so focused on so many different things. We talk about privilege this, privilege that. But listen, aren't we all privileged here in this place, in this country? As Christian, we are. I don't care what social group you're from, you here, you're privileged. You can speak. It's the greatest privilege of them all. Don't allow anyone to take that away from you. Your ability to speak. Fight for it. Because the moment you cannot speak is the moment we're all going to be like all these other countries where our brothers and sisters are suffering. And in order for us to bring a change to our society, you and I must be willing to do the task that is at hand. You don't have to be a preacher. You don't have to be the best speaker. You don't have to be none of that. Start close to you. Reach out to a friend. Reach out to a family member. Look for opportunities when they present themselves. Keep yourself disconnected from all the stuff so that you will have opportunities, so that it doesn't matter who it is. You will be able to speak to their situation by witnessing to them. Use your life. Use what God Jesus Christ has done for you. If you don't know how to speak, like I said, point them to the gospel. Tell them, read this. Do what Peter does, pass a track. We all need to figure this thing out. The world is dying in need of a savior. We have the answer. Not because we're good, but because we too used to be what? Lost in our sin. And God saved us. So let us do the saving as well. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, mighty God, we ask you please in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Give us more than just beautiful, eloquent sounding words. It's of no use to us. If after I've spoken this here and I go and I forget everything that has been said here and I don't make any effort to change certain things, to reach the world at large by every means possible, then what am I doing? I pray for everyone here, myself, all my brothers and sisters here, God. Help us to figure out by your spirit how we can 
do the work you call us to do for your glory. Help us to pay attention to our neighbors, to their circumstances, to their situation. Help us to be willing to be uncomfortable at times, God. But please, God, stir up in our hearts this desire, this passion, this obedient heart, God, to do the work you call us to do. We pray for our brothers and sisters that are being persecuted, that are being oppressed. They want to speak your word, but they can't. They can't even read the Bible openly. They have to hide to read your scriptures, God. But we have the freedom to read whenever we want. But so many of us don't even bother doing it. I pray for this country, for revival in this country, God. So that what we used to do at first, we will do again. That we will become a place that is still sending people out, sending missionaries, investing around the world to push forth your word, God. Please, God, forgive us in all the ways we fail to do what you call us to do. Help us, God, to change course. For it is all about you. It is all to your glory. And we thank you for all that you do. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Well, I think that concludes our service. Or, Mr. Walt. Okay. Well, you are dismissed. (laughs) See you guys next Sunday. Thank you.